Okay, so Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, Chapter 5, The Meeting of Nanda Maharaj and Vasudeva, Texts 21, 22, and 23. Mm-hmm. So I'll do 21. Tam Drisva Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tam Drusva Sahat Sautaya Put the verse up. Tam drisva sahasotaya Deha pranam ivagatam Prita priyatamam durbhyam Sasvaye prema vivalaha Tam drisva sahasotaya Deha pranam ivagatam Prita priyatam ham durbhyam Sasvaye prema vivala Tam disvasaha sotaya Deha pranam ivagatam Prita priyatam ham durbhyam Sasvaye prema vivalaha Practice your Sanskrit. <laughs> it's a little choppy. <laughs> if you practice, you get it. And if you chant the Sanskrit mantras perfectly, you get transcendental realizations. These mantras are powerful. That's why when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we can actually associate with Krishna. So all the mantras, the Vedic mantras, especially the, the verses, actually bring about a certain consciousness. So if we chant these mantras according to how they're supposed to be chanted, then you actually get a very powerful experience from these mantras. It's not just saying some words. Mantra is everything, actually. It's, it's actually called sh- Shasta. Shasta means mantras are actually powerful weapons that bring about spiritual understanding, spiritual realization, and they can also be used as weapons to kill the enemy. Mantras are very powerful. 
especially the mantras in the Vedic in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's important we chant these according to how they're supposed to be chanted. Because if you say something different, you can create a different meaning. And that's what happened when that's what happened when there was one chanting of the mantras to create a demon to kill Indra. He chanted the mantra wrong. Instead of a, a, a long A, he did a short A. And he got a, he got a demon that was killed by Indra instead of the opposite. So the mantras, when they're pr pronounced clearly and exactly, they have a very powerful meaning and effect. So, just like when we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Not Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ramo, Hare Ramo, Ramo, Ramo. <laughs> you don't get it, it's not, there's no Ramo, it's Rama. Sometimes we chant Rama. So, you know, so chanting the mantras according to how they're supposed to be chanted is a very important point of actually developing the proper consciousness and getting the effects of the chanting also. So practice, and because you know we used to do that, just practice chanting mantras all day, just verses from the scriptures. Just read the whole Bhagavad Gita, and just chant the mantras, and then actually it becomes very. You can actually feel the transcendental energy appearing through the chanting of the mantra. Very powerful. <laughs> okay. Tum, him. Vasudeva, Drisva, Sing, Sahasa, Suddenly, Utaya, Getting Up, Deha, The Same Body, Pranam, Life, Eva, As If, Agatam, Had Returned, Prita, so pleased, Priyatamam, his dear friend and brother, Dorbyam, by his two arms, Sasvaje, embraced, Prema Vivalaha, overwhelmed with love and affection. So here's the meeting of Vasudeva and Nanda. When Nanda Maharaj had heard that Vasudeva had come, he was overwhelmed with love and affection, being as pleased as if his body had regained its life. Seeing Vasudeva suddenly present, he got up and embraced him with both arms. <clears throat> Nanda Maharaj was older than Vasudeva, therefore Nanda Maharaj embraced him, and Vasudeva offered him namaskara. Now here's an also a very important principle that when two people come and there is some affection, it is the senior one that offers the embrace and not the junior. <laughs> Sometimes it's done wrong in our society. The junior one will want to off the embrace. So that is not the proper etiquette. It's the senior one that comes and gives. Bhakti Chiruswami was very enthusiastic to, give, to embrace his god brothers all the time. But we would never go up and embrace him. We, when he came to embrace, then accepting him as senior, then we would, you know, respond to his embracing. Now this is proper etiquette, not that junior can go up and embrace the seniors. <laughs> Like that. So we should have to know. We have to know this etiquette because Vaishnava etiquette is the ornament of a devotee. How we, how one prop, practices the principles actually brings about the understanding of the the spiritual culture mm -hmm. as a way of doing things. So here, that's that's why Prabhupada only gives one line, two lines. He says, Nanda Maharaj was older than Vasudeva, therefore, sometimes when two people are spiritually equal, then the older one is considered senior by age. 
Age is considered seniority, but spirituality is considered to be the supreme principle of seniority. It's like when Sukadeva Goswami appeared into the assembly of sages, although he was only 16 years old, everyone rose to greet him because they knew he was m most senior spiritual, although he was younger. But when people are equal on the spiritual level, then it's the older person, one who is older in age, is considered to be senior. So. Okay? It's very helpful to know all these things because it's we're practicing spirituality and there's a culture that that allows spirituality to grow nicely and so we follow the culture we get the we get a lot of the understanding of the process and we avoid fences too <laughs> okay verse number 22 pujita sukham asinam prisvanamayam adritaham Prasakta di di swamajayor idamaha visampate. O Maharaj Parikshit, having thus been received and welcomed by Nanda Maharaj with honor, Vasudev sat down very peacefully and inquired about his own two sons because of the intense love for them. <clears throat> Verse 23 Dvisva Bartu Pravayasa. Idanim aprajasyate prajayasaya nivritasya prajaya samapadyata. Translation My dear brother Nanda Maharaj, at an advanced age you had no sons at all, and you were hopeless of having one. Therefore, that you now have a son is a sign of great fortune. <laughs> Purport. Here's some more interesting little points. At an advanced age, one generally cannot beget a male child. At an advanced age, one generally cannot beget a male child. If by chance one does beget a child at this age, the child is generally female. Thus Vasudev indirectly asked Nanda Maharaj whether he had actually begotten a male child or a female child. Vasudev knew that Yasoda had given birth to a female child whom he had stolen and replaced with the male child. This was a great mystery and Vasudev wanted to determine whether that this mystery was already known to Nanda Maharaj. On inquiring, however, he was confident that the mystery of Krishna's birth and his being placed in the care of Yasoda and still hidden was still hidden. There was no danger since Kamsa at least could not learn what had already happened. Omagyan timidandasya ginajana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya manobhistam staptitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kadamayam dadanti swam padanti kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Vansha Kalpa Tarubhisya Kripa Sindhu Vaevacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasiddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So yeah, Vasudeva was a little concerned that in Nanda Maharaj had known that he gave, his wife gave birth to a female child, but he didn't know. Actually, the actual story is, and it's quite interesting, that when Krishna was born, he was born in two places at once. He appeared in two places. In the jail cell of Vasudev, 
and in the, in the house of Nanda Maharaj. But no one could see Krishna as he appeared in the uh, house of Nanda Maharaj. All they could see was a female child. But Yasoda actually had two children, both Krishna and Subhadra. But only the female child could be seen and not the male child. So when Vasudev, trying to protect Krishna from Kamsa, arranged for him to get out of the jail, that was a mystical experience how all the guards fell asleep, all the chains fell off, and all the, guard, the gates of the jail opened up. Vasudev was easily able to sneak Krishna out of the jail. In the middle of the night, cross the Jamuna River and come all the way to Vrindavan and then come to the house where Yasoda was, take Vasudev Krishna, the Krishna that had appeared in the jail, and place it where Yasoda had given birth to a, be a female child. And he picked up the female child and left. Nobody saw anything. Everyone was asleep. But Krishna was also there, but unseen in his unmanifested form as Vrindavan Krishna, the two-handed form of Krishna. So when Vasudev put the four-handed form of Krishna, Vasudev Krishna in, in Mathura, both Krishnas merged into one and became Vrindavan Krishna. And that's the actual understanding. Some Scriptures don't make that point, but Bhagavatam does to understand that Krishna actually took birth in Vrindavan also. <laughs> and so, and now they want to understand whether Nanda Maharaj had known this. And obviously, when Vasudeva inquired about that, and he said, um, that you have a son is a great fortune. Uh, Nanda Maharaj didn't know that his wife gave birth to a female child. <laughs> and so this was good because Vasudev could understand that Kamsa wouldn't have, was thinking that the child born to uh, Devaki in jail was female. And after trying to kill her, which he wasn't able to do because she is the spiritual energy, she's Krishna's sister, she's Yoga Maya, she's powerful, then he became somewhat repentant and started apologizing to the Devaki for killing all of her children. Of course, when the demons get defeated, sometimes they become a little humble, at least in this case, <laughs> but didn't last for long. <laughs> He went back to his demon nature after after a few minutes, but no way. But somehow or other, the whole situation changed by Narada Muni coming and in, informing Kamsa that that child that you tried to kill is born somewhere else. <laughs> so this, and therefore, Narada Muni wanted to speed up the appearance of Krishna in the world by saying that. And of course, then by Kamsa's spies, he understood that Krishna was actually living in Vrindavan. And that's when all of those demons were coming. You know, it was Putana, Sakatasura, Trinavarta, Agasura, Bakasura, you know, Keshi, no, Vyomasura, Aristasura. So many asuras were coming to Vrindavan to try to kill Krishna. <laughs> but it's obvious you can't kill the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He kills everybody, nobody can kill him. <laughs> he, kills the, he kills the non-devotees in the form of time. And he elevates the devotees by taking them out of their body and bringing them to the spiritual world. 
So Krishna is the actual person who nullifies all of people's material existence, <laughs> either in the form of time or directly with the devotees in the form of bringing them back to the spiritual world. So no one can, but Krishna is, so the demons tried to kill Krishna in so many ways. <laughs> and, um, but this was disturbing Krishna. Although the demons would come and sometimes Krishna would play with them and, you know, like when Trinavarta came, Trinavarta was flying, he was the whirlwind demon. He, he came and uh, Krishna was sitting on the lap of his mother Yasoda and then he understood this demon was coming, so he became very heavy. And his mother couldn't understand, boy, this child is becoming so heavy. She couldn't hold him anymore, so she put him down. And that was Krishna's plan. And then when the whirlwind demon came, he could pick up Krishna. And Krishna wanted to go for a ride. You know, he wanted to fly through the air you know, and have some fun. <laughs> So, you know, there was this demon who was, you know, self-styled airplane. <laughs> and he was just riding around and he was grabbing Krishna and trying to take him away. And he was going to try to kill Krishna. But Krishna was holding on really tight. He had his seatbelt on. <laughs> and the demon couldn't do anything. <laughs> you know, Krishna had gotten a first-class seat on the airplane. <laughs> And he was, you know, he didn't want to leave. <laughs> so he was flying around and Krishna was having fun. And then this demon couldn't get him, he wanted to throw him down on the ground and smash him. That was his plan. And then, but Krishna thought, you know, all right, enough riding around. <laughs> so then he became so heavy that the demon couldn't hold him anymore. And the demon came crashing down to the ground, smashed to get the rock in the... He was finished, Jai. <laughs> Devotees like that when demons get killed, right? <laughs> There's a class of people who engage in Krishna's pastimes and they just like to hear about Krishna's dancing with the gopis in Vrindavan. But they don't like to hear about Krishna's killing demons because they think, you know, what's this killing business? It's more like... But Krishna kills the demons in order to, order to free them from their demoniac activities and liberate them and bring them out of their material suffering. So he's actually giving them the benefit by removing their... And so, so Krishna has fun killing demons. But Krishna was getting a little disturbed when some demons were coming and harassing his devotees. And when, he, when the devotees were getting harassed by the demons, then, then Krishna was getting a little unhappy. And so then he arranged for Kamsa, because Krishna, Krishna controls everything. So he arranged for Kamsa to send uh, Akrura to Vrindavan to bring him out of Vrindavan and bring him to Mathura. So Krishna could kill Kamsa and that way he could stop all these demons from coming into Vrindavan. <coughs> but that didn't work either. <coughs> Somehow Krishna did come to Mathura and killed Kamsa, but the demons were still coming, and there were other demons at that time. They were more like demoniac soldiers. Before they were these mystical demons that could transform their form. And that's a fact. Their demons can have, they have great power because they perform austerity. By performing austerity, one gets power. <laughs> In, even in Krishna consciousness, if you perform most, the more perform austerities you perform, the more powerful you can become. Not necessarily Krishna conscious, but powerful, you know. And if you can use that power to serve Krishna, then that's benefit. So power, so austerities bring power, just like people in the material world. When they want to get elected to some post, they will give up all of their activity and focus completely on getting votes, traveling around, eating, not, not even eating regularly, meeting people all the time. They perform these personal austerities in order to somehow or other get their position. And they deny themselves their own personal satisfaction and, and enjoyment in order to get their positions. So austerity brings power. And so... Uh, 
Um, these demons had performed so many great austerities that they could actually change their form. It was even recently, not recently, this happened about 70 years ago. Yeah, about 70, maybe 60 years ago. One particular politician in America died and nobody would let, they wouldn't let anybody see his body. <laughs> as soon as he died, they took his body away and, and put a closed casket. Because he changed back to his demon form when he died. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a fact. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, some people, that, that news somehow leaked out. And so there are demons, even in today's world, who have the ability to change their form. They come from other planets, they look like human beings, they take positions in, in society, and then they control politics through their demoniac policies. <laughs> so the demons can even change their forms even, even now to some degree, because many of these demons are coming from other planets. And the ones that are grown on this planet, they're not very powerful. <laughs> They're just wearing suit and tie and they make, they just give people trouble. <laughs> so yeah, demons are everywhere. <laughs> um, in fact, Prabhupada said in 1972, he said it again many times after that, he said, Kali Yuga, the demons are only going to increase. He said the devotees are going to have more trouble, but don't worry, Krishna will save you. <laughs> just take shelter of Krishna. He saved Devaki, he saved Prahlad Maharaj. Therefore, he will save the devotees because the whole world is full with demons. <laughs> we can't even recognize them. They look like nice guys. <laughs> they give in charity. They, they also, you know, look very handsome looking. I mean, Ravana was so handsome. He had so many wives. He was very, very physically attractive, Ravana. So demons can even look very nice. <laughs> They also behave very nice in public, but behind the scenes they may be something else. So that's a demon. Anyway, so Krishna Paritranayam Sadunam Vinasanaya Chiduskritam Dharma Sam Starpanartaya Sambhavami Yuge Yuge Vinasanaya Chiduskritam. So Krishna comes to this world to purify the world by eliminating the demons. So sometimes the devotees ask, well, what? Where's Krishna now? There is so many demons. And Prabhupada said, he's here. He just chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. And Kali Kale, Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. And Krishna is incarnated in this age as his holy name. So he is manifested in his form as the holy name which are meant to destroy the demonic population and bring about an age of spiritual enlightenment. That is the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So we should try to chant as much as possible. Prabhupada said 16 rounds. We give you 16 rounds because that's all you can do. But <laughs> he made it easy. When Prabhupada first started the movement, he said, 64 rounds a day. That was his first declaration. But the devotees at that time protested that that was, they couldn't do it. It was too much. Jai Sri Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. So Srila Prabhupada said, all right, 32 rounds. And then there was more protest. <laughs> You know, this was the early day. We don't have time, Prabhupada. How are we going to do everything else? Prabhupada said, all right, 16, no less. <laughs> so, yeah, so he gave us the bottom line. But he used to say, he said, 16 rounds on beads, innumerable rounds off the beads. In other words, chant always. When you're not, when whatever you're doing, you can also chant Hare Krishna. Because chanting the holy name means you actually are on, on the transcendental platform. 
you're free from the influence of the material energy and you're actually connected with the process of devotional service in a very real way. So if we make that policy of chanting as much as possible, uh, practice that, and then it doesn't come easy because to chant all the time is not is something that comes by way of spiritual advancement, but one can practice to chant more and more. And the whole idea, which is the essence of spiritual life, it's mentioned in the Bhagavatam, that out of all of the regulative principles, there are 64 regulative principles. You read Nectar Devotion, goes the whole list of things to do, things not to do. You know, just like, um, just like, I don't know, things to do is um, take prasad. <laughs> things not to do is don't eat food that is not offered to the Lord. Things to do is to, um, well, there's so many things to do. And every day here, Srimad Bhagavatam, things not to do is, uh, you know, don't waste time. Uh, when there's so many do's and don'ts in deity worship also, how to do deity worship properly, just like, yeah, one should not talk loudly before the deity. One should not um, chastise another person before the deity. These are just some principles of rules and regulations. One should uh, uh, always sit properly before the deity, with, you know, like this. Or if you have to sit in the chair, that's nice too. But sit straight when you sit in the chair. Because, you know, we're presenting ourselves before the Lord. He's there in the form of the deity. So we should... You know, it's not like, we're just like hanging out, you know. <laughs> so sitting up properly is important. And sitting cross-legged if you're on the floor, that's important. Or the way she's sitting, that's nice also. That's acceptable. Yeah, so different ways that we actually, there's do's and don'ts. But out of all of the do's and don'ts, there are two principles that are prominent. And one's a do, and one's a don't. One's then the do is always remember Krishna, and the don't is never forget Krishna. So we have to remember to remember Krishna, and we have to remember not to forget Krishna. That's all. <laughs> By practicing that, you're on the transcendental platform automatically because. Remembering Krishna means, you, you know, you're on the spiritual platform. You're connected with Krishna. Krishna is there through smarnam. That's why when we shravanam, hearing, kirtanam, chanting, and if when, when one's hearing and chanting are continuous, then smarnam becomes easy, natural. But we can't go right to smarnam if we're not doing shravanam and kirtanam. It's difficult to go right to the process of smarnam. We have to hear more and more and chant the glories of the Lord. That's why we have these classes, we have kirtans, we have various functions so we can chant the glories of the Lord. By chanting the glories of the Lord, we can also make our own program to chant the glories of the Lord individually then we, it's easier, easier and easier to remember the Lord. And when you remember the Lord, then that's perfection. <laughs> that's perfection. And when you remember Him with love, then that is the supreme, ultimate perfection, or the goal. <laughs> okay, so these are some points to think about. So the holy name is actually the foundation by which all of our advancement in Krishna consciousness is is executed. So therefore, that's why we emphasize, above all of the other activities, two points that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to make sure that devotees understand the process, but the process is also understood in various ways, and the essence of the process is to chant Hare Krishna, and to associate with and serve Vaishnavas. 
these two things are the foundation by which everything else follows nicely. Chanting the holy names, Vaishnav Seva, and Vaishnav Association, like that. And then we can add one more, Jivadoya. And Jivadoya means preaching, <laughs> or giving the mercy to others. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes. Hare Krishna. Do we have a microphone for the... Um, Oh, it's already gone. We're we're microphoneless. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll repeat your question because nobody on the scene can hear you. Huh? When your parents are demons. We don't kill them, don't, no, 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 that's not the idea. <laughs> Try to change them by giving them Krishna consciousness, giving them some prasadam. She has a what? You have you nourishing on your altar yes. at, at the house. Yes, and she saw it, put it like this on, on top, on the bottom, and in the corner. I said, why you do that? She said, I come to you to visit and uh, I change your whole environment. You'll be happy. Don't do that again. Now it's a little bit so. It's very delicate. What I have to do, I mm. can't no, it's it's practically impossible. There are some some cases where parents do change, but it takes a long time. And depending on the parent, some of them are, you know, don't believe in God, or some of them are very strict Christians, and they think that this is she's a strict Christian, right? Atheist. Yeah, well, <clears throat> if, do, do you talk to her? If you can talk to her? Uh, I talk, but uh, when I visit uh, her and uh, put on Kirtan, she gets nervous, so I have to talk it down. Mm. I mean, you talk logically like, <clears throat> like uh, if you say there's no God, but then how did everything, how does the sun rise at the same time, the moon how does <clears throat> how does the body work in such an organized way? Who created all this? So it's not no logic. Huh? <clears throat> well, usually with the atheists, uh, we can't do anything. But I mean, we have uh, there's situations. I know one disciple of mine. She's aspiring for me, and she's. Her husband was really a demon. I mean, he was a first-class demon. <laughs> he was the best of all demons from Croatia. <laughs> and uh, one day, when his wife came into the temple, and she brought her daughter with her at the Sunday feast, he came so angry, he came running into the temple with his shoes on, and grabbed the daughter and ran out. <laughs> I think you were there that night, yeah. So I saw the whole thing. I mean, we didn't want to create any problems, so we just let him go. But, but after some time, the relationship fell apart, and you know. So you can try to help your mother by giving her prashadam. Prashadam is food. You can say this is some nice food that. Uh, I don't know how, if you say it's coming from a temple, that's a problem too. <laughs> no, 
Tell you can say one of my friends in Ljubljana made some nice food and he wants to give it to you. So here, you can say something like that. Because if they take prasadam, they gradually actually change, go slowly. It may take a long time. There was also a, uh, one lady in, also in <laughs> Croatia. <laughs> so, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of demons there. <laughs> Her her father was first class. We used to call him Harani Kashipu. <laughs> so, and and but she would sneak and give him prasadam every once in a while. And sometimes he ate it. <laughs> sometimes he didn't. So yeah, it's not an easy thing. And so uh, you can just pray for her, like that. Be nice to her. It's still your mother, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, but if you don't have to live there, it's better for you. Oh, okay. Oh, she's in Germany. Oh, okay. Well, then you're okay now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Krishna will protect you, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so anyway, what can you do? You can't really, um, you know, they say you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> you can't change a person who doesn't want to change. <laughs> yeah, so then... Just pray for her, that's all you can do. <laughs> anyway, but you go on, when you, as you make advancement spiritually, she'll get some benefit. She may not know it. It's called a gyata sukriti. It means unknowingly making advancement. She'll get some mercy from the Lord because she has a son who is a devotee. When, when people are connected to devotees, either through family relationships or other means, those persons, although they're not devotees, they get benefit also. So your spiritual advancement will also give, allow Krishna to give her more and more mercy. And, uh, yeah. I mean, we have so many examples of that. There are hundreds of experiences with devotees around the world with parents. And sometimes they change, sometimes they become favorable, and sometimes they never change. <laughs> what can you do? It's just the way the material life is. Yes, question? That's not e always easy. There's one work by Narahari Sakar. He gives a little indication of how to make that distinction. Uh, I have that pamphlet. You can read it. But I can't remember what he said. Uh, by, by experience, you have to know. And by the advice of others also. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can't understand because sometimes the pot washer in the kitchen is the, is the supreme personality in the temple. <laughs> it doesn't depend on what position you have. It depends on what is the purification of the heart. So sometimes we have, even persons who have a very small we you know we can't use the word small, but a, a service that is not preaching, they're just doing other service. They may be the most advanced in the area. You can't tell. But you can tell by their symptoms, how they're absorbed in service, how they're very eager to serve others. And these are indications of a, an advanced devotee. How much they're absorbed in service, how much they're eager to serve others. 
and how much they don't waste time with material things. <laughs> These are indications of people who are more fixed in Krishna consciousness, more advanced. E yes, Hare Krishna. A few years ago there was? Article. Article. Social media article. Oh, there's an article on Dandavats. Yeah. And his father was what? Um, so he. Mm -hmm. He he wasn't an atheist. They were doing what to the father? Sitting. Sitting. Yeah, I I can't hear. I can I can hear you, but I can't make out the words somehow. If you. T yeah. So the Yamadudas only come for people who are sinful. Yeah, there's some benefit there, but you can't. Sometimes you can't see. We had that same example. With one very senior devotee in our movement. His father was a hunter. He was a very, to use a, a term. He was macho. Mm -hmm. You know what macho is? <laughs> Tough guy. <laughs> so he had, he had all kinds of guns and stuff, and he would do hunting. And so he was sick, and then. Uh, when at one point he was leaving the body, and while he was dying, he called out to his wife, bring my gun, as he could see these guys coming to get him. <laughs> so he was thinking he could shoot the Amadudas, you know. <laughs> but that's not possible. <laughs> so yeah, there, there are, and there was one devotee, he was in the hospital in, uh, where was it? Was in, also in Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> The reason why demons attack Croatia a lot because is that everybody's shatri is there, and so so they like to attack where the shatri is. Nisringalila can write a book about her experiences. <laughs> she has had so many <laughs> fighting off demons. <laughs> so yeah, they're all and the demons are everywhere, but. When a devotee became, is sinful, or a person is sinful, they have to see Yamaraj <laughs> somehow. So how Krishna's mercy comes 
to that person who is a relative of a devotee is hard to always understand. Uh, but maybe they get, maybe they have to go through this suffering of all of their reactions of their sinful activities, and then, then come back and get a good body in their next life. Usually, they don't get a good body in their next life; they go down. So maybe because of being connected with a devotee, I think that's the answer. They'll get a good situation in their next life, but they have to suffer. Because sinful activities have to go somewhere. People either have to pay for them or they have to be absolved by the power of devotional service. And if they're not absolved by the power of devotional service, then people have to undergo the suffering that, they, uh, that, that, that these sinful activities bring. So yeah, they may have to go to Yamaraj get the sinful reactions burnt off by the form of punishment and then come back and be in a good situation in their next life. As opposed to a non-devotee who has no connection with it, suffers, goes to Yamaraj, gets all the sinful and then takes birth as a, you know, a rat in the next life or something. Or, a, or maybe a very bad birth in their next life. So I think the good birth is the benefit that, that they get from that. Because these sinful activities have to be, have to be nullified some form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question? So, um, this happened to me in my hometown, like my grandma. She passed away, like, I think, eight, nine years ago. Come a little closer. Yeah. Your voice is... More like a song, and I, I can't hear all of the notes. <laughs> um, so there is one. Um, my grandma passed away, like, I guess, eight, nine years ago. Eight, nine years ago. Yeah. Somebody was outside crying? Her room, and she said that they are crying, and obviously we couldn't see, but she was seeing, she told us in the morning. And then uh, after a few days again, she saw, she said, oh, a man, very ugly man came on the bull. Just see who is he, you know? And she just, she just started seeing these things. Um, yeah. But we understood that what she's seeing, you know? Um, and then, yeah, obviously, I mean, all of a sudden she got sick, and then she just, she just left the body. So... For me, it was till today I couldn't understand how it can be because uh, okay, she she didn't do any you know puja or something like that. But at, you know, if we see from one point that she was actually pious. Yeah, she'll she'll get. She's very pious. But she never she never ate meat. Right? Yeah, she's pious, but because she's pious, she'll get a good birth in her next life. Suchi nam samatam gehe yoga brasa pradayate that when accumulation of pious activities brings about a very auspicious birth in the next life. So she'll be born in another pious family or in a very rich family, either one. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't understand, like, uh, she, yeah, she was pious, but then how come a pious person is seeing Yamadutas or things? You know? She was seeing Yamadutas too? Yeah, that's how she described it. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So, I mean, I, I Maybe that. you never know. Uh, can you actually say that she never did anything wrong in her whole life? <laughs> you can't see. You can't see that even in her early part of her life. But the only way you can get rid of your reactions to pious activities and sinful activities is by devotional service. Otherwise, you have to go through that. Karma builds up 
and then in, it comes in the form of reactions in different ways. But devotees are free from karma because they perform devotional service. So only by devotional service can you nullify the reactions of your karma. If you don't do any devotional service, then you have to get the reactions of your karma, good and bad. King Nirga, he was a very pious king. He was giving in charity to the brahmanas, but somehow he did some fault in performing charity. And he had to suffer for that fault because he offended a brahmin. So when it was, came for time for death, when he died, uh, he was re uh, requested, do you want the results of your pious activities first or do you want your results of your impious activities? And he said impious, so then he took birth as a lizard. <laughs> He was a pious king, never performed any sinful activities, except that he, he, made, he didn't make offense against an Brahmin, accidentally, actually. So whatever your grandmother did, there might have been something there that causes her to get some reaction for something negative. Because living in the material world, you can't help but performing sinful activities. And you, if you step on ants, you have to pay for that. If you're breathing germs, you have to pay for that. You're killing living entities. But if you're a devotee, then you're free from that. So that's why devotional service nullifies all previous karma and present activities too. So just living in the material world you can't, you have to perform sinful activities. It's just automatic. It may not be severe, but still. And unless you atone for that, then that reaction comes at one point in life. Or maybe at the time of death. It'll come at one point or another. The example is King Nirga. That's the perfect example. P very pious king. But one offense to one brahmana, and that was all, and then he had to take birth as a lizard. <laughs> but Krishna pulled him out of the well, and then he came back, and then he he got the mercy of Krishna because he was such a such a pious king. And uh, but he had made that one mistake, but he didn't atone for that mistake. <laughs> so pious activities do not nullify impious activities. They don't. <laughs> Only Krishna consciousness nullifies. <laughs> you know, you're, everyone's accountable for whatever they do in the material world. That's why even now devotees are still getting some of the results of their karma. But they're getting it in a small way. A small way. Prabhupada said, you are a murderer in a previous life. You came to Krishna consciousness. You're engaged in devotional service. You cut your finger. So the reaction is there, but minimized. <laughs> but at one point, when you stay in devotional service and after some time, then there's no more karmic reactions. Because we've been building up karmic reactions for thousands and thousands of lifetimes. So your grandmother may also may be getting something from her previous life that wasn't cashed in in this life. The karma stays there, life after life after life, until you become Krishna conscious. Only then. That's the power of devotional service. It nullifies all... And even pious activities, the results of pious activities are also nullified. Like, you may say you were destined to become rich. <laughs> and so you came to Krishna consciousness and, and you didn't get the money. Haribo. <laughs> because Krishna didn't want you to go back to the material world. So, <laughs> so but... <laughs> So even the results of pious activities you don't receive. Sometimes you don't. 
Unless Krishna says, oh, all right, they're going to become rich and they're going to use the money in the right way, so, okay, take it. <laughs> Prabhupada said, I was, Prabhupada would say, I was destined to be more wealthier than Birla. Birla was the topmost entrepreneur in India. He was the richest person. Prabhupada said, I was destined to be even more but when I came to Krishna, Krishna took it all away. <laughs> but now he says I have more money than Birla anyway. <laughs> but I'm using it for devotional service. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hare Krishna, thank you. Yes. You can be fanatic for the right thing. If you're fanatic for the right thing, that's that's okay. And that means I don't want to miss Mangalarti. I want to chant my rounds every day. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to eat anything but Krishna Prasadam. Good fanatic. <laughs> Uh, well, you have to be practical too. <laughs> the baby has to get some care. <laughs> That just happened to me yesterday. <laughs> I got disturbed by a fanatic disciple. But anyway. <laughs> it was a big one too. So <laughs> what to do? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but we don't want it to happen. <laughs> So devotees should be careful not to that their enthusiasm or their overzealousness, and that's a better word, doesn't cause you know, distress or anxiety to others. Yeah. Mm. Like I was riding a train one time and I had my earphones on and I was chanting. I didn't know that I was chanting loud and people around me were. And then somebody said, you know, calm down, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I did because we have people, we don't want to disturb people. So Sometimes we disturb them because they need to be disturbed. But that's another thing. <laughs> but generally we are always respectful uh, to others. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Ananta Prabhu Ki Jai. <laughs>